Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Katarina, and uh, I like to start by introducing what we know about functional specialization in the human visual system. So um, many labs in the last decades have discovered functional specialized areas. Um, for example, if you show subjects in the fMRI image of uh, faces and objects, some areas in the ventral pathway respond selectively to faces compared to any other category. And the same has been found for places, uh, bodies, and visual words, for example. And while we learned a lot about what these specialized areas are doing, what their function is, and whether they're causally involved in, in processing these categories and so on, there's some questions that remain unanswered. The first one being, why do we have functional specialization for these categories, and why not for others? And the second, why is functional specialization a good design strategy for the brain or the visual system in the first place? Um, and of course, this has been debated, and there's hypotheses out there, one of them being that they might be experience-driven. Right? These categories are basically the categories that we experience a lot. So some labs went, labs went on and said, okay, let's check for cars. We see cars a lot. We have a lot of visual experience with them. But there's no evidence for functional specialization for cars in the, in the visual system. Uh, another hypothesis is that they are, these are basically evolutionary hardwired. Um, so another opportunity would be maybe we have something for snakes or spiders, something that was you know, evolutionally important for survival to us, but there's also no, no evidence for functional specialization for these categories. Um, an additional hypothesis is maybe there are different computational constraints that underlie these categories compared to others. Um, and in particular, like we don't think it's just computational constraints, but maybe it's experience plus computational constraints that makes these categories um, that they need these, these specialized areas, basically. Um, but so far, there was basically no mean to test these hypotheses. Um, and today, we want to try to see if we can gather the computational constraints, and I want to tell you how. Um, well, as we just heard before in other talks, and I know all of you will be aware of that, that we can use deep convolutional networks as model for the visual system. Um, so yeah, if you take your, you know, the, when, when convolutional networks re-entered re computer vision, they quickly um, revolutionized, they were like the best performing, task performing um, systems. But then the good thing for, for vision scientists was that actually there bears some similarity with the human visual system. So when you look at the, the filters, extract them from different layers, they actually you know, have similarities to what we know from, from the human visual system and the filters that we see in early layers or more, you know, more pattern like, um, more abstract pattern in the mid-level layers or even more like abstract object type of filters in the late layers. So many labs went on and then said like, okay, let's test how useful are these, these um, activations to predict uh, uh, activations in the human visual system. Uh, and that actually worked really well. So early, layer, early filters will predict uh, activity in early visual areas, mid-level in mid, and high-level in high-level visual areas. Um, so it seems that CNNs trained on large data sets of naturalistic images can actually be used to build predictive models of the human visual uh, system. Uh, and that's, that's great, we didn't have that so far when we can use that to learn a about, lot about um, the, uh, the working uh, of the human visual system. But how can we use these models to address these why questions that we have? So how can we use CNNs to answer why we have the particular functional specialization we do in the brain? And today I want to particularly focus on uh, faces a, and, and objects for, for two main reasons. First of all, face identification and object categorization is a task that we do every day, we do it all the time. And also it's one of the strongest contrasts we see in the brain if we, when, if we show faces and, and objects. There's strong evidence that these are uh, segregated neural, like there's segregated um, um, neural processing involved um, in these two categories. So what we can do now um, to test these questions, we can say, okay, let's take a deep net and train it on face identification, right? And so that's our idealistic face processor, if you like, and like a model for the face selective area we see in the brain. And we can take another network and say, let's train that on object categorization, and that 
being optimized to do object categorization and thereby being a model for, for object-specific um, processing in the brain. And um, then the next question would be, well, can each of these networks do the other task? So is a network that's optimized to do one task also useful to do the other task or not? And then we can even go one step further and ask, what is if we train one system on both tasks at the same time? So the only difference here being that basically, uh, that doesn't work, but basically that at the end you see these two task classification layers, where one is for objects, one is for, uh, for faces, but otherwise it's the same architecture, so nothing has changed. And then the question is, well, how, how well does this task and can this, this network actually learn these two tasks as well as the separate systems? As, a, as the separate systems that we had in the, in the first step. So that's what we want to do today. So the first question, can each network do the other task? What we did to, to address this question is we took a, a standard AlexNet um, uh, convolutional network, randomly initialized, and we trained it on identity. So we took more than 1,700 identities from the VGG phase two data set, um, and optimize that, train that network um, on that task until it reached plateau, so there was no more improvement in performance, and basically said that's our face CNN, that's our you know, face processor. And then we took a second um, AlexNet randomly initialized and trained that now on object categorization, and in particular we took um, 423 categories of the ImageNet data set that were prototypic uh, objects in the classic like vision science sense, so we removed animals, we removed lots of categories that looked more like scenes and all, all these, um, and then trained that. And now you might wonder there's different categories, so we made sure that the images were matched, so we varied the images per category, but the total number of images that each of those networks would see um, was matched. We trained that again um, till it was at plateau, and then now the question is, okay, if you have these two processes, how can you find out whether one can do the other task? So what we did in order to test that is uh, we removed the task classification layer and basically said, okay, let's show the face CNN uh, images from 10 held out identities, so identities that CNN has never seen before, and let's just extract the features from the penultimate layer. So we get a vector of, um, um, or we get a vector of feature, a feature vector for each of those images that we present. And then we do the same with the object CNN, so we have 10 held out object categories, uh, we present the images, extract the features, and then the nice thing is we can also do the inverse, so we're showing the face images to the object CNN, the object images to the face CNN, and again, extract the features from those images. Um, and then we can just simply take these, these, um, these vectors and put them in a linear classifier, so we used our NSVM here, uh, it's a 10-way classification, so chance level will be at 10%. That's the decoding accuracy on the y-axis that you see here. And now we want to know how useful are the features that we extracted from the face CNN to do face versus object decoding. Um, and that's what we see. So we see that the features are good, really good in doing face decoding. They're not as good in doing object categorization. Um, now the same thing when we take the features from the object CNN, we see the exact inverse. Uh, so it seems that the face train network does, do well, does not do well on the object task and vice versa. So to come back to the first question, can each network do the other task? Um, no, it doesn't seem to be that way. Um, 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 at least not as well as a task that's set optimized to do that. Okay, and maybe that's already the answer of like why these things need to be segregated, but that's not the ultimate test. The ultimate test would be to take one network uh, and train that network on faces and objects um, at the same time and see can that network do both tasks. Um, and I just want to mention here that this technique has been nicely uh, introduced by Keladel in 2018 and uh, in, a, in a nice review summarized in 2019 where they used that for the auditory system and now we're borrowing that method to use, uh, to use it for, um, to test for task segregation in the visual system. So, can one network do both tasks? Um, we're taking the separate face CNN from, that I showed you before, the separate object CNN, and now introducing a third uh, network that's a fully shared dual, we should call this a fully shared dual task CNN. So it's the identical architecture, except that at the end you see these two classification layers uh, for faces and for objects, and we present that network during training, batches of faces, 
uh, and they get updated with a loss function and then there's alternating batches of objects, they have their own loss function, we update the weights, uh, faces and objects and so on and we again do that till there's no more improvement uh, in learning so both of these tasks will reach uh, the plateau of, of learning. And now the question is, you know, if that network is able to discover a common feature space to do both, it should perform equally well, or if not, if these tests should be separated, to have like very separate feature spaces, then we expect that the shared network does worse than the separate networks. So um, now we want to ask, can one network do both tasks? And uh, what I'm showing you here is the test performance. So we have a left out set of images that we didn't train the net, didn't we didn't use for training. So top one performance. Uh, the red bar is the performance from the separate um, face CNN. And uh, oh, this doesn't work anymore. All right. Separate face CNN. And the yellow bar is their performance from their uh, separate object CNN. And now what we want to know is how well does our dual task network do where we get two performances from the same network. Uh, and that's what we see. So there's basically a huge drop in performance, in particular for the face, um, for the face tasks. It seems the shared network performs significantly worse than the separate networks. So to get to our second question, can one network do both tasks? Uh, no, the answer is no, at least not as good as the systems that have been basically separately optimized and had to fool their full, all the parameters to do one task. So now you might say, well, you used AlexNet, and it's not a particularly good network. It's not super deep, um, and maybe it doesn't have enough capacity. Maybe that network just cannot share anything. So um, whatever you try to, whatever task you share, you will see that drop in performance. So can one network do any two tasks? Um, so we went on and said, like, okay, let's test that. Let's take the face CNN that you've seen before, and let's additionally introduce an animal CNN. So we took. 150 uh, categories from um, the image net that were all animals. So there were reptiles and mammals and, uh, and all these different animals. And then we trained a network um, on these categories, um, again, matching the number of, of, of training images, of course. Um, and we took animals because we know from the literature in the brain that there's actually that animals actually to a certain degree activate face, face selective areas. So we, we assume that their feature spaces are more closer to each other. Okay. Uh, and then we again trained the fully shared network on faces and animals and so on. And our hypothesis is that we expect that this shared network actually performs better on faces than the one shared with objects. So um, that's the performance we got. So face performance is identical to what you've seen before. The green bar now is showing the performance from the separate animal network. Um, and uh, just as a reminder, that's the drop in performance that we saw when, when, we, when we shared faces with objects. Uh, so what happens now when we share faces with animals? That's what we see. So basically, the performance for faces is, there's still a drop in performance as we expect, but it's much smaller than when shared with animals, uh, when shared with animals and with objects. So how well a network can do seems to depend on the type of task or the computational constraints that these tasks have. So um, yeah, to come back to the, the questions that I posed at the very beginning, these why questions, why do we have functional specialization for these categories? Our results so far suggest that some categories can basically not be shared with others, with, with others without, uh, without a cost. And that automatically brings us to the second question, why functional specialization is a good strategy in the first place, is uh, you want to well, you well perform on these relevant tasks that are important. And that's, that's what the brain cares about. Um, now, what, what I've shown you is basically the two extreme cases of like, you have two separate systems, and you, you compare that to a system that shares everything. But now you might ask, really, is that true? Like, can no processing be shared? That, that doesn't seem efficient, like completely separate systems. And it's also not what we see in the brain, right? We see that early, some early visual processing is shared, and then later we see these functional specializations when we go uh, later in the hierarchy. And the cool thing about this method that we're using is that we can actually ask this question, can some processing stages be shared? So um, when we look at the fully shared network here, uh, and we know this doesn't perform as well as the separate networks, we can say, what happens if we share a little less? Uh, or, you know, let's, let's even like branch a little earlier and see how, how well does that performance go. Maybe at this level here, we achieve the performance that we would from the separate networks. 
or do we have to go all the way back and these two tasks can basically not share anything? Um, and when we look at the spectrum from like not, like not sharing anything between sharing everything, our hypothesis would be that faces and objects branch rather early, um, versus faces and animals can actually branch later um, in, that, in that spectrum. And this is ongoing analysis, but it seems like that's exactly what we, what we see. Uh, and then I just want to mention that this can be done for any two tasks that you know, are relevant to humans and the visual system. We can test that for go on and say we test this for faces versus scenes. We can also test this for within domain questions like why are identity and expression processing segregated, are they segregated at all? Um, and we can also go on and say is the degree of sharing predictive for category selectivity, selectivity in the brain? Um, if you take like several tasks, it, you know, there's always, depending on how fine-grained you look, there's always some selectivity to certain tasks, and is that degree selective by, um, uh, predicted by, by the amount of sharing that we see with this method. And then, of course, we can also go on and say, why do certain tasks branch earlier or later? Because that's, that's an open question, right? What is, what is different about these two tasks in terms of their features or how homogeneous one, one, uh, one task is or the other, and so on. And we could go on and systematically um, test that. Uh, so overall, we think there's large opportunities for future research. One thing we're doing uh, is asking also if what happens if you use a larger network with much more capacity, uh, that does that network spontaneously discover task segregation? So you can basically imagine if you have an arbitrarily large network, at some point it will be able to accommodate two separate networks within one network. Um, and we're currently trying this with VDG16, and we, we see that there's no more drop in performance actually when we share these tasks for neither of the tasks. So now the question is, and, uh, and that's what the current analysis look like, is like you find units in that network that are specialized to one task and units that are specialized to the other task. Um, but that's ongoing work and I'm happy to discuss this more. Um, but um, in general, what we want to take this to eventually is if we train these models on all these different tasks that we think are important for the visual system, uh, is that model then actually also a better encoding model of the, um, of the human visual system? And, and yeah, bring that back to the, plane, uh, to the brain and see uh, can, it, can, it, can it better explain all these um, specialized areas that we see. Um, and yeah, in general, I want to conclude and say that uh, I hope I convince you that image computer models trained on natural visual tasks can help us addressing, addressing these big open questions in vision science. And uh, yeah, by that I want to conclude, thank Nancy and uh, the Canvasher Lab, all my collaborators, and thank you for your attention. Let's take a question, if anyone has questions, uh, before heading to lunch. There's one way over there. Here's the mic. Uh, one of the differences between face processing and object processing is that object recognition is entry level. Face recognition is subordinate level categorization. Do you think that some of the differences could actually be at the ontological um, layer, at the ont ontological uh, level that you're entering the process? Mm -hmm. Nice talk. Yeah, I mean, th that's exactly what I, I think one is. Uh, you could say one is a within a domain also and a between domain or I don't know if it, depending on the level you go. So that's exactly something we could we could test. Like is that is that one thing why um, why uh, phase and objects are segregated? Why you think it's not the only thing is for example I see um, I did one test where I tried to train a network on faces and cars and I see that they cannot share anything and they're both basically within within their uh, the same level. Um, and, and it seems like they can, you cannot share, if, like train, learn the features based that is shared between faces and cars, so it can't be all of it. But yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, hey, so I really like the set of experience here over yeah. there on the left. Um, have you tried to play around with a transfer learning setting where you rather, instead of simultaneously present everything, do the one category and then the next um, and see what happens with uh, performance job whatsoever? <laughs> no, I haven't. Um, I mean, the yeah, main idea being that 
we basically learn these things at the same time. And then my, my, my problem is always if I take an image net, like an object train network, and then I train it on faces, what happens to the object performance? Right? Like how do you make sure that that performance is maintained, which is what we think is happening in the brain. It's like not when we, see, when we learn faces, we suddenly forget about objects. So I'm, yeah, it's, it's, but in general, yeah, I mean, it's, it's another way to look at that. This, this here is, this way is basically to say, like we always have these separate networks that we keep uh, that we want to compare to right away, and then the, the dual task network is doing the exact same thing, just split up into branches, right? So we can do the direct comparison. That is no longer possible if you do one and then train the other one on top of it, because you have differences in training. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for the talk. Going sure. back to biological relevance and what tells us about the brain, I wonder how much can we deduce by using the same architecture, the same deep net that we know, of course, is a faithful representation for vendor stream up to IT, for really answering the question whether, um, um, let's say, the specialization that we see for faces or for objects that we know they're there in IT, and the way we do it, like your approach with the deep CNN, we could do the same thing for other kinds of categories that we know IT is not sensitive directly for, the reason being that we know that sensory inputs transform into categories even beyond the, uh, you know, the ventral stream, go to frontal areas. Mm -hmm. So if we assume, uh, if there is a different architecture, if the brain, the brain does it in a different way, this categorization for this other kind of stuff, tasks that do implicate it, then we cannot assume, it seems to me, the same architecture. We can only assume the same architecture for assessing functional specialization, sorry, only for those areas that we know that IT is also already uh, selected for. So in a sense, it becomes a bit tautological. So it seems to me that some kind of limitation to your approach. You can only say that I have selectivity and non-overlap for those kinds of distinct pairs of categorizations, object versus faces, for, or for those ones that we already know about. That's, that's the case. Because you assume the vendor stream architecture, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you basically say we are restricted to the ones that we know we have functional specialization about, but... Because you know already, the arch you assume the architecture is the one of the deep net uh, that we validate as a model for vendor stream. But if categories are not there in IT, how, and maybe they are formed later in frontal areas, how can I assume that this is the model Right, right, right. I mean, this is restricted to visual categories, right? This is the visual system we're talking about really like these, these tasks that we do in, in, in the visual system. So I, I totally agree if you want to go more to different tasks that are beyond visual, purely visual tasks, then you need different architectures and then that cannot directly be applied. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. All right, let's thank all of our speakers right. and go to lunch.